started. For those of you that have um, joined us today, welcome uh, to this webinar on One Health. It's all connected. Just to get you orientated, I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me okay and can, that you can also see the slides okay. If you look at the very top of your screen, you'll see a Q&A chat feature, a raise hand feature. So if you are having problems with the connection, just let us know um, by uh, the chat feature or raise your hand and we'll see if we can get, get you connected. But hopefully everyone can hear me and can see my slides. So I'll go ahead and get started. I also wanted to mention that if you're interested in seeing any of these slides or if you would like me to send them to you, I'd be happy to share them with you as well as this recording of the webinar. My name is Paige Adams. I'm a uh, research assistant professor here at K-State Olathe. Um, I work a lot with the students that are in the uh, veterinary biomedical science program. It's a master's program that we have here at the Olathe campus. And before I, before I start talking about uh, the concept of One Health, I also want to give you a really short um, introduction uh, or background information regarding where I'm coming from. I'm a veterinarian. I graduated from Texas A&M and also did a PhD research at Cornell University at the vet school there. I also uh, worked at the University of Texas Medical Branch. So I was working uh, as a veterinarian in a medical school studying arboviruses, which are viruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes and other vectors like ticks. And so um, I've had many opportunities throughout my career to see different angles of the One Health concept. And, and I'm going to continue to talk about that as well today. So I don't see any questions, so we'll go ahead and, and keep moving. So let's talk about what is One Health. I'm sure maybe many of you know what One Health is all about. So uh, also um, throughout the, the presentation, I'll be posting a couple of poll questions for you to answer, just to give me an idea of if you're understanding the concept and also just give me an idea of what your backgrounds might be. So I have one poll question here. I'm asking you whether or not you have Heard of, of One Health. And so hopefully you have on your screen something about how many of you have heard of One Health. Just answer yes or no, just to give me an idea, and then we will go from there. So it's like most of you have actually heard of One Health. Um, so far we have about 80% or so that have heard of One Health, 20% have not. So uh, let's talk about that. So what is One Health? It basically encompasses the complex interrelationships among humans, animals, humans in the environment, and animals in the environment. So it's this interconnectedness that we have on these three different uh, basic areas, humans, animals, and the environment. So why do you think it's important to understand One Health? So, for one thing, it does provide a better and more holistic view of the relationships between humans, animals, and the environment, and this really emphasizes this connection and impact that we have on each other. So, some examples of this would be things like zoonotic diseases, um, maybe the impact of the natural or built environment on humans and animal health, and even vice versa. And then also comparative medicine as well as food safety and security. So that all encompasses and is under this One Health concept. One paper that I would recommend that you have a look at is one that was published in 2015 on infection ecology and epidemiology. And it really describes in broad terms what One Health is all about. A lot of times you've heard of One Health as in One Medicine. Um, that kind of thing. Zubiquity is another, another term that's often used for One Health. And this paper sort of looks at those different terms and also considers um, One Health in terms of research as well as in education. In this paper, 
It also has a really neat diagram. It's called the Umbrella of One Health. And it basically encompasses all the different topics that you would think about in One Health. Uh, so it's a little bit more specific when you're thinking about the animal, human, environmental impact of each other. So under the umbrella, you can see that under, there's some red looking uh, topic area, or actually fields of science that are listed below the umbrella, like environmental health, ecology, veterinary medicine, public health, human medicine, molecular biology, microbiology, and, and health economics. So all those different fields of science also fit under the One Health concept. And in this paper, they, they um, group um, two different concept, major concepts, is zoonotic infections, as well as comparative medicine and translational medicine. And today, I'm going to be primarily talking about zoonotic infections, uh, specifically emerging infectious diseases. Before I go on, I also wanted to mention a couple of informational resources on One Health that are really helpful. And one of them is the One Health Kansas website. Uh, this has a lot of nice um, information as well as um, teaching materials. If you happen to be a teacher, this is a really great website to get some really nice videos and uh, teaching materials if you're going to be teaching this in the classroom. Another one is called ProMed, and ProMed is basically a listserv that uh, will send you notices when there are outbreaks that are occurring around the world. And this is in uh, diseases in plants, or diseases in animals, or diseases in humans. And so you will get these reports, periodic reports of outbreaks that are occurring as they're occurring real time, basically. So it gives you a really great idea of what is going on around the world that is outside of Kansas City, for example. So that is one, another great resource that I highly recommend. And another one that you might want to check out is called Health Map. And what it does is it gets information from organizations like ProMed and other reporting agencies and basically maps it globally. And so the idea is to try to give you an idea of where the hot spots might be that are occurring in real time. And uh, this was launched in 2011 in order to hopefully try to predict where the next outbreak might occur. So again, have a look at that website. I think it's really inf informational. And then lastly, there's this website, One Health Initiative, uh, which is also very focused on One Health topics that will provide information regarding publications, conferences associated with One Health. They also mention a uh, One Health journal, if you're interested in reading more about uh, specific types of One Health issues that are considered under One Health. So have a look at that one as well. I think that's a very informative one. So going back to this umbrella of One Health that was described by this group uh, from Sweden, what we're going to be doing today is mainly talking about zoonotic infections, mostly emerging infectious diseases. And it does, it, it does include some of these concepts that are listed within the zoonotic infection cloud. So what are emerging infectious diseases? So these are defined as infections that have newly appeared in a population. So they've never been there before, and then they just show up unexpectedly. So uh, many of these emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic, meaning these are diseases that are transmitted from uh, animals to humans. And this could also involve vectors like mosquitoes and ticks. The causes of emerging infectious diseases can be including, could include the spread of a brand new pathogenic agent that has uh, not been described before in that particular region. So it could be a new virus or bacteria, protozoan, prions, or uh, parasites. Or it could mean that maybe one of those agents had some sort of genetic mutation or recombination to allow them to all of a sudden jump into the human. A lot of times, these discoveries of these newly emerging infectious diseases that they have not been, they've been around, but they haven't been previously detected. And with the technology today, now we are able to actually detect these brand new agents that we didn't even know about. Also, we are, again, with the technology, we're also able to identify uh, what are causing these infectious diseases. So we know that there's a disease, but we don't know the cause. And so now we're actually able to identify what is causing that particular disease. So why, uh, why are there emerging infectious diseases? 
There can be many different reasons for this. One can be changes, of, changes in ecology, uh, such as land use. So there, and, and the, these are things that we do, such as building dams, changing agriculture, doing intensive agricultural practices, deforestation, uh, that kind of thing. Also, climate change is a big player. There can also be changes in, in human demographics. Uh, population growth can have an impact. People moving from one uh, area to another, such as rural areas to the cities, or if there's war or immigration, these are, can be uh, reasons for, uh, there are reasons for uh, changes in demographics. And there can also be changes in human behavior associated with emerging infectious diseases, such as changing uh, eating habits, doing more outdoor recreational activities, maybe increased use of child care centers where there's a high concentration of, of little kids with um, infectious diseases. And then also uh, international travel and commerce is a big player on these emerging infectious diseases as well as changes in technology and industry. We know that our world is getting smaller, globalization is occurring uh, with our food supplies. Uh, we're also have changes in uh, food processes and packaging, you know, even organ and tissue transplants with this advancement. We also have uh, problems with emerging infectious diseases. Blood donations, drug therapy, causing immunosuppression. These are all important reasons that emerging infectious diseases could occur. Not to mention poor public health measures with the economies. Sometimes that can have an effect on public health and prevention uh, programs that are out there. Perhaps there's not uh, adequate sanitation or uh, vector control to try to decrease the amount, numbers of emerging infectious diseases. So we're, we're, as far as where the emerging infectious diseases are occurring, they're occurring globally, of course. And this map that was published by Morenz basically shows you where, in red, where the newly emerging infectious diseases are occurring throughout the world. The ones that are listed in blue are re-emerging or resurging diseases that I'll talk about a little bit later. And the ones in black, such as the anthrax, bioterrorism, that would be emer deliberately emerging infectious diseases. So what are the global trends? What are the global trends in emerging infectious diseases? Most, as I've mentioned, most of the emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic in origin. And as I mentioned, zoonotic or zoonosis is any infectious disease that can be transmitted from a non-human animal to, uh, and these, these can be from both wild or domestic animals to humans. They can also involve vectors such as mosquitoes and ticks. So we know that there's at least 1,415 pathogens known to affect humans. My question to you is, how many of those are considered zoonotic? So I'm going to put up another poll question for you. So you should have a poll question there saying, what percent of human infectious diseases are zoonotic in origin? And there's a couple multiple choice answers that you can select from. Um, have a look at that and, and take your best guess. I'll give you a few minutes here. Polls are looking pretty good here. So, so far we have about 57% uh, of you think it's 81% and about 43% of you think it's, think it's 61%. So the answer to that question, let's see if I can get it to behave. Okay, fine. So the answer to that question is 61% are, are zoonotic in origin. And of the zoonotic emerging infectious diseases, most of them, or 72% of them, are wildlife in origin. So a lot of wildlife animals have a big impact on causing these emerging infectious diseases. and can have a huge effect on public health. Here's a couple of examples. Nipah virus was one that emerged in 1999 in Malaysia, and it, was caught, and it caused high case fatality rates uh, due to severe encephalitis, um, um, inflammation, and infection of the of the, of the central nervous system. And basically, this virus emerged from fruit bats or flying foxes in, in Malaysia. So that's just one example of a wildlife species causing a, uh, one of these unknown viruses to emerge. 
Another example is severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, or SARS, as you probably remember. This one emerged from palm civets in China in 2003, and as you probably recall, it caused almost a, a near pandemic of severe respiratory disease in humans, and that went globally, as you know. So there's another example. So another example might be Middle East respiratory symptom coronavirus, or MERS. Um, that's, this has been a most recent one that emerged in 2012. We had our first imported case in 2014, and it's most likely, cases are most likely linked to countries in or around the Arabian Peninsula. It has, these, this particular virus does have a pretty high mortality rate, about 42% worldwide. At this time, it is probably a wildlife origin uh, virus. It's still uh, being worked out as far as if the origin is coming from camels or bats or from other animals. So the jury is still out as far as what the uh, virus origin came from regarding wildlife animals. As far as uh, continued global trends, so since the 1940s, the number of emerging infectious disease events caused by these pathogens that originate from wildlife is, has increased significantly with time. So there's, there's a 19, 2008 study by Jones et al. that looked at the incidence of emerging infectious diseases over decades, starting in 1940. And basically what was found is that there's been 52% of emerging infectious diseases in the most recent decade. And there's been an increasing trend, which I'll show you here in a moment. But uh, but also you have to consider not only the global health, you also have to consider the economic health of those diseases and how they impact different countries. So this graphic shows the estimated costs for these di different emerging infectious diseases that have occurred over time. So on the y-axis, you'll see the numbers of billions of dollars associated with those particular outbreaks. And on the y-axis, it shows the years of when those outbreaks occur. You can see the relative expansion or decreasing amount of costs associated with those particular emerging outbreaks. So NEPA, uh, which I mentioned earlier in Malaysia, that happened in, what, 1998. And you can see that it, it cost that particular country about $400 million as, as far as its impact. And when you compare that to SARS, which was a worldwide event, it was costing uh, the world basically up to $50 billion associated with that outbreak. So you can see the relative amounts of money associated with these really important emerging infectious diseases that are wildlife in origin. Again, going back to this paper by Jones et al. that looks at the different decades of emerging infectious diseases, he looked at and actually broke it down as, to, as far as what types of pathogens are causing these emerging infectious diseases. Are they viruses? Are they bacteria? Are they rickettsial? Are they parasites? And so what you see in the first graphic is you see the, the increase, the uh, gradual trend of increasing number of emerging infectious diseases. And then you also see, at least in graph A, that the majority of the pathogens involved in these events are bacterial or rickettsial in origin. You also see in B that as, we, as I mentioned earlier, that most of them, 60% or 61% are caused by zoonotic pathogens, most of which are caused by wildlife origins. And you can see that in, in the white bars. And so, and again, you're seeing a, a gradual increase. One thing that I'd like to mention is that you'll see that there's a bit of a spike uh, between 1980 and 1990. And that is primarily due to the incidence of AIDS and HIV, which there are more immunocompromised folks that were developing unfamiliar emerging diseases that had not been identified before. So that's why you see a spike in the 1980s. And then lastly, they looked at the data regarding whether or not they were vector-borne or non-vector-borne. And you can see that in most cases, the vector-borne or non-vector-borne made up the majority, but you can also see that there's a a large percent, about 23% of the EN are associated with vectors. And you can also see that there's also an increasing percent uh, associated, or numbers of events associated with vectors as well, I mean, especially when you look at between 1990 and 2000. So another important paper. 
The same paper also went to great lengths to actually graph uh, those particular, that particular data to try to show where those particular emerging infectious disease outbreaks were occurring throughout the world. And so here uh, they are graphing basically the hot spots of where zoonotic pathogens are occurring from wildlife, from non-wildlife, as well as from uh, vector-borne pathogens. And so I think that was a very informative way to really show where these emerging infectious diseases are occurring. And as I mentioned earlier, the health map it also sort of makes it even uh, more relative uh, by actually doing it in real time, by putting these reports, put, putting them together, analyzing the reports, and then basically graphing where those outbreaks are occurring in real time. So very important when you're thinking about and talking about emerging infectious diseases. So how many newly recognized human pathogens have there been since 1973? Almost looks like yearly. Well, not yearly, but it, it, quite a few diseases have emerged over the years. You can see the whole list of them that I have listed there on your slide. So you can see 2012 MERS was occurring. So what's next? You know that there's going to be another outbreak. And of course, you've heard a lot about Zika virus lately. Zika virus was named for the Zika forest of Uganda. It was first isolated in uh, rhesus uh, monkeys in, in 1947. And you can see in the graphic its migration uh, over time and now that it's made its way into the United States. So the, the graphic on the, on the bottom left shows that the mosquitoes are responsible for transmitting the virus. One is Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, which is there on the left. And you can see the distribution of these particular mosquitoes in the United States. And then the other mosquito that's responsible for, for transmission is Aedes albopictus, which is the Asian tiger a mosquito. And this graphic shows the distribution of those mosquitoes in the United States. So, of course, since its detection in 1947, it's, it's uh, made its way to Brazil and other countries. This graphic also shows the, the, all the countries that have been affected by Zika and detection of those, of the, of those cases. And in February of this year in the United States, there were at least 30 travel-related cases in the United States and then one sexually transmitted case in the Texas. Uh, just as a reminder, Zika virus is considered an arbovirus because it is transmitted by mosquitoes. It's part of the family Flaviviridae genus Flavivirus, which is related to viruses like dengue, if you've heard of this, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, and West Nile viruses. And as far as why there's been an, an uptick of the numbers of cases since 1947, uh, more and more research is looking into this. And so far, the only paper that I've come across is that uh, there has been a mutation, so it's now able to replicate more readily in humans. And as I mentioned, it's certainly in the United States, more from travel-related cases. But February 2016, the governor of Florida did actually declare a state of emergency for the counties involving Zika virus. And of course, now there's an even greater concern since uh, the virus is located in Brazil now of, what, of how the Olympics are going to be able to handle that. So what about re-emerging infectious diseases? These are considered infectious diseases that have existed but are rapidly increasing in incidence or geographic range. As far as why this might be, occur be occurring is that there could be that can be associated with social or political changes. It can be associated with changes in agricultural or industrial practices, land use changes. Oftentimes, they're, uh, again, these are diseases that have been around, but all of a sudden they become more deadly. They've, they've mutated or changed, or they've acquired a drug resistance. These can be reasons why they are reemerging. So some examples would be things like dengue virus, which has been associated with increased transportation, travel, urbanization, that kind of thing. There's also yellow fever virus, again, probably due to its, its reemergence due to uh, resistance to drug and insecticides. So 
uh, again, let's look at this graphic again, and this basically shows uh, the worldwide occurrence of re-emerging infectious diseases and resurgent diseases, and those are shown in blue, just to give you an idea. On the next slide, what I've done is I've li basically listed what those diseases are or what particular pathogens are the ones that are re-emerging. And so they're, they're all listed here, um, including things like uh, you know, drug-resistant staph, tuberculosis, malaria, uh, Lyme disease, diphtheria, uh, Rift Valley fever, plague, yellow fever, dengue, mumps, and measles. The graphic that you see in the top, top right is basically showing the difference between 1960 for dengue or uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever and to after 1960. You can see that it's greatly expanded globally. And we still continue to have a report of this outbreak um, as we speak. So when you're thinking about disease emergence, it's really a very complex interaction. And there's lots of different driving forces. I think this graphic is a really nice one showing a wildlife emerging infectious diseases, human emerging infectious diseases, and domestic animal emerging infectious diseases. And you can see that they're all very well intertwined. And then there's the layer of uh, on the outer on the outer part of the diagram showing the different driving forces that may be impacting those emerging infectious diseases. One of them that you'll notice there with the human emerging infectious diseases is a global travel. So this is going to launch me into uh, the other topic that I wanted to talk to you today is the role of globalization on emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. So what is globalization? So it is by definition, it's a process of interaction and integration among the people, companies, governments of different nations. It's a process that's often driven by international trade, investment, and it's also uh, aided by information technology. So generally speaking, it basically involves the movement of people, products, services, capital, and ideas. And, and it's rapidly increasing due to different factors, one being technology that I just mentioned, reduced cost of transactions, increased mobility of capital, open economies with freer trade, and international organizations. As I mentioned, our world is getting smaller. So, so if we break it down into the movement of animals and animal products, movement of food, and movement of people, I'm just going to basically concentrate on those three concepts. Now, as far as movement of animal, uh, you can break that down into legal animal trade and illegal animal trade. So if we think about legal animal trade across, across the globe, from, uh, from this study from 2000 to 2004, there were at least 37 million live amphibians, birds, mammals, and reptiles imported to the United States from 163 countries. So you have to think about that. So you're bringing in all these different animals into the United States, and now we're being exposed to diseases that, and our animals are being exposed to diseases that they are, are, they are not immune to. So that's a major concept. Then there's the illegal um, animal trade concept where it's estimated uh, from this particular study by Weiler in 2008 that it's estimated to be around 5 to 20 billion annually in illegal animal trade. And you know we're not immune to that. We, we also have a demand for illegal wildlife that could be about as much as the legal demand. This is a table that basically shows, when you're thinking about non-traditional pets, uh, this lists all the different types of non-traditional pet species, their associated diseases, and the affected species. And you can see it's mainly human beings that are affected by these non-traditional pet species. So let's say, let's see the Gambian rat, for example, and the disease that's been associated with Gambian rat importation has affected humans, and, and that is certainly the case that happened several years ago, where we did import monkeypox into the United States from a Gambian rat that transmitted to prairie dogs, and these prairie dogs were pets to, for, certain, for certain people, and those human beings ended up developing monkeypox, which is a huge, which was a huge uh, news item and outbreak because, of course, it's closely related to smallpox. So that's just some, some examples of how these diseases get into our country. The other one is movement of food. If you think about it, we have about 50% of our food is imported to the U.S. from at least 150 countries. 
So that's a lot of food being moved in and out of the country. And this trend, of course, is increasing. And of course, there's also the potential for widespread outbreaks from foodborne diseases and even deliberate contamination of these food of, of these of these food items, even including feed ingredients. Even feed ingredients that are fed to our livestock can also subsequently infect humans. So it's a long chain of transmission, but it is possible. Then there's the illegal movement of food. And now this is something I don't really consider but often, but uh, the more you look into it, it's kind of alarming how much illegal bush meat trade is occurring from Africa. And so it annually, uh, worldwide, it, it's about 500 million of sold, basically. And there are several communities that it's been sold to in the United States. Some diseases associated with some of the bush meat that might be consumed would be things like Ebola virus, HIV and AIDS, monkeypox that I just mentioned, as well as SARS. So that's a huge concern. And then there's the legal movement of food. I mean, these are food items that we are transporting and importing and exporting constantly every day. And here's just a couple of examples of outbreaks that have been associated with food that we've imported from different countries. Of course, we have different food inspection agencies that primarily are responsible for making food, making sure our food is safe. One is the USDA Food Safety Inspection Service that, that monitors meat, poultry, egg products, and, uh, it, and those that are imported, as well as the um, FDA that, that is concerned with all, almost all other foods. I do want to quickly mention that the U.S. is trying to respond by this concern about importing uh, legal uh, legally to our country as far as bringing in diseases that we're, we are not immune to. And there's a the Food Safety Modernization Act that was signed into law in 2011, uh, basically is looking more closely in, uh, at imported food safety. It made several different laws associated with this that are mentioned here, uh, basically making sure that our, our imported imported food is safe and that the countries that are exporting it to, to us are safe and using practices that we consider safe as well. And so they have several incentive programs for these countries as far as following these particular uh, safety techniques and protocols. Now, and then the last uh, the topic I wanted to talk to you about is movement of people. So as you know, there's a lot of tra uh, travel going on across the, across the globe. Let's see if this start. Hopefully it will start. I'm not sure if it's starting or not. <laughs> but anyway, it's a time-lapse video showing air travel across the globe in 24 hours. And what you'll see is basically the movement of airlines going back and forth across the United States. And so we've got a lot of travelers going on, a lot of traveling going on for business, leisure, and other purposes. This is by air, uh, by road, rail, sea. And so it's ongoing. So my next poll question is, how many tourists do you think traveled abroad in 2015? So you have several different choices. Um, you have 600 million, 1.2 billion, 1.8 billion, or 2.4 billion uh, traveled abroad in 2015. I'll give you a few minutes. Okay, well, we all did pretty well. So we have about 33% said 1.2 billion, and we have 67% um, estimating at 1.8 billion. So very good on the 1.8 billion. That is the correct answer. Okay, this is this is a graphic from the World World Travel Organization. And it basically shows the uptick and the gradual increase in the numbers of international arrivals that have occurred from 1995 to 2015. And you can see that there's been about 1.2 billion people 
that were traveling at least in 2015. So this is not going to decrease anytime soon. So that kind of gives you an idea of the impact of, these, of the movement of people. Another graphic from the World Tourism Organization basically shows the number of tourist arrivals in 2015 as well. You can see that most of them, about 51%, are arriving in Europe primarily, Asia second, and I believe the United States third. So that kind of gives you an idea of the amount of travel that's going on internationally. So um, this isn't all bad. Globalization isn't all bad. Some good things that we can point out about this globalization is, with re especially with regarding disease outbreaks, is that we have improved our ability to share research and medical advances. We've improved our communication by uh, global surveillance and, and disease responses to these disease outbreaks. And we've also developed a global health initiatives. So as I said, shared research and medical advances, uh, globalization has definitely stimulated our ability to develop better diagnostics, advances in molecular biology, drug development, our understanding of the immune system, uh, approaches to new vaccines to, to respond to these outbreaks. As I said, global surveillance and disease response has also improved because we've been more global. We've been able to communicate even better uh, across the globe. Here's um, a couple of systems that have been, uh, networks that have been put in place for animal diseases, the Global Early Warning Response System, as well as the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network for Human Diseases and Outbreaks. Again, this is to survey as well as to respond to these particular outbreaks that occur worldwide. There's also been the launching of several different global health initiatives, uh, one against malaria, TB, as well as the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. Uh, that's a big one that's uh, been launched. United Nations noted, uh, uh, United Nations also uh, developed their own set of global health initiatives, mainly focusing on the things that are listed there, like ending poverty and hunger, universal education, et cetera. And then another example would be the Global Alliance for Rabies Control, uh, trying to eliminate the, the numbers of rape, deaths associated with rabies. So I just want to quickly summarize uh, what I sort of just talked about on emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. Those are considered part of the One Health concept because you're talking about animals, you're talking about humans, and you're also talking about the environment, like climate change, for example. There are several different drivers of the environment that are also impactful for these diseases. Uh, we also talked about globalization. Uh, this brings people around the world a lot closer, but it also means uh, in rapid spread of diseases. And so you have to think about uh, global disease spread in terms of movement of uh, animals and animal products, food, and people. And to try to combat some of these risks of global epidemics, there have been much better strides to organize ourselves so that we can respond and uh, identify these outbreaks when they occur and as they're occurring. So hopefully this is give you, gives you a pretty good idea of what is involved with One Health, how complex it can be, how interactive it can be, how impactful it can be on each of the different um, aspects of, of One Health. And I'll, I'll go ahead and take some questions now if you have any. You can go to the button on the top right of the Q&A and I can answer any of your questions not, we'll go on. As you're um, asking your questions, if you have any, I also wanted to mention if you enjoy this topic and, and enjoy learning about One Health and all its complexity, there is a One Health course that we offer here at K-State Olathe. There will be a fall course offered in, in this year, and you are more than welcome to, to uh, talk to me about it and, and as far as signing up for it, in which we talked a little bit more in depth about the the different concepts of these interrelationships that I just talked about. The One Health course that are offered here, that are offered here at K-State Olathe is, is part of a graduate program here. There's a Master's of Veterinary Biomedical Science program that we offer here. 
And you can see the listing of all the example courses, one of them being One Health, uh, but we also offer courses like the regulatory aspects of drug and vaccine development, vaccinology, which will be offered in the summer of this year, as well as immunology of domestic animals. So these are just the selected, selected courses that are associated with this graduate program. If you're interested in learning about that, please let me know. The VBS program is uh, part of many programs associated with these here at K-State or Latha, and that includes biological and agriculture and engineering, adult and continuing education, uh, horticulture and food science. And I'd also like to mention that we have two new graduate uh, certificates available. One is the Professional Interdisciplinary Sciences and the Professional Skills for uh, STEM Practitioners. And I see Sally has a question. This is, with the effects of SARS being so costly, have there been any policies or methodologies put into practice to help prevent or control similar diseases in a better way. Certainly, globally speaking, now that everyone's aware of SARS and the impact that it can have, there have certainly been more strides to develop policies as far as uh, you know restricting the movement of people that are that have fevers and things like that. You saw that the response was pretty good, but I have a feeling that the response is going to be even quicker for these kind of things, especially with influenza virus, among other things. So definitely there's been a step up in policies and laws and practices, uh, definitely. Hopefully that answered your question. So as I mentioned, the graduate programs here at K-State are laid up. As far as the veterinary biomedical science program, a lot of our students are working full time in the animal health industry. So we, uh, we try to offer this program so that it's very flexible and customizable to your, uh, to your work schedule. And we also offer thesis related or non-thesis options for this graduate program. You can work full time while attending evening classes. Most of our courses are offered in the evening or late afternoon. These, this also sets you up for a very nice collaboration and networking opportunity, not only with the students that are in the class that are working in the animal health industry, but also with the speakers that we bring in uh, from the animal health industry. You also have, you can also access the classes either on the campus here at K-State Olathe, or we also offer uh, distance or online courses that are also available. And then also you can, Start the coursework immediately. You don't necessarily need to sign up for the uh, master's program. You can, you can sign up as a non-credit student uh, or non-degree seeking student up to nine credit hours before having to make the decision whether or not to continue pursuing your master's degree. So if you haven't been here, I uh, sure welcome you to come and, and visit the campus. This is a shot of, the, of our building. It's very beautiful and we would love for you to come by and visit. Uh, I would be happy to visit with you as well. Uh, we can set up an appointment to meet. As far as where we're located, we're off of College Boulevard, right at the intersection of Highway 7 and 10. So it's a very easy uh, location to get to. If you happen to be around uh, Saturday, April 16th, we have K-State Open House. So we will have food and uh, lots of information regarding the programs here, as well as other booths that will be available to you and your family. So please join us on April 16th here at the K-State Olathe campus. I will be there as well if you'd like to come talk to me as well. And with that, I will go ahead and um, answer any other questions that might come up. Otherwise, I really appreciate you joining, uh, joining me today to talk about One Health and its impact on us. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and, and stop the uh, webinar. But if you have any questions, I'll wait a few more minutes before closing the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it.